Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin Habibina wa nabiyina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Wa man ihtada bi ihsanin ila yawmin din Amma ba'd Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una Wa anfa'na bima alamtana Wa zidna ilma Amin Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin First and foremost, on behalf of Masjid al-Siddiq, I would like to welcome each and every one of you for joining us this evening for our annual pre-Ramadan program. Um, as you all know today, our, our main speaker will be our Imam Sheikh Adib. Um, but before that, we'll have a, a younger prospective Sheikh, inshallah, our brother Khalid. Uh, but beginning, before we get to our speakers, we'll have an opening Quranic recitation by one of our young brothers. After the presentations, inshallah, we will move for dinner and then Salat al Isha. Uh, maybe dinner, uh, Isha, Salat al Isha first and then dinner. Depends on how our program goes, inshallah. Um, please re be reminded for our sisters downstairs, there will be a number that will be shown on the screen in which if you have questions, you can text it and we will um, forward that to our speakers here. Um, and there will be time for questioning at the end of the presentations, inshallah. Um, for our youngsters, please, we'll keep it quiet, inshallah, so that we can all focus on the presentation here this evening. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help this presentation, this knowledge of beginning here to be beneficial for all of us. Ameen. Without further ado, I'll call our, one of our madrasa students, Talha, to begin with the opening recitation, inshallah. أعوذ بالله من السيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما معدودات فمن كان منكم مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر وعلى الذين يطيقونهم فجية طعام مسكين فمن تطوع خيرا فهو خير له وأن تصوموا خير لكم إن كنتم تعلمون سهو مطال الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم السهر فليصم ومن كان مريضا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر ولا يريد بكم العسر ولتكمل العدة ولتكبروا الله على ما هداكم ولعلكم تشكون وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداع إذا دعان فليستجيبوني وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرسدون يرسدون Jazakumullahu khairan and inshallah now we'll move over to our brother Khalid inshallah and he will do his short presentation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, Inshallah, uh, we start in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we send absolute peace and transesting, transesting blessings on, uh, on the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inshallah, today uh, my, my talk will be very brief. It's just about the virtues of Ramadan and the act that we do inside of it of fasting, right? As we know in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as our Shaykh Talha, our young Shaykh Talha just recited, yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya yuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykumus siyam. That, O oh, people who believe, 
that fasting has been prescribed upon you, right? And firstly, do we know what fasting is? What is this siyam? Does anybody know the li linguistical meaning of siyam? Feel free to answer, please. No? It, it's to abstain from something. It means to abstain from something, right? And in this case, with the pillar of Islam, as we know, siyam, sawmu Ramadan, is mentioned to be one of the pillars of Islam. In this case, it's abstaining from food, drink, and your desires, right? But the actual definition is to abstain from something. As Allah mentions in the Quran, in Surah Maryam, um, the ayah is, فَإِمَّا تَرَيِّنَّ مِنَ الْبَشَرِ فَقُولِي إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَنِ صَوْمًا That, um, if she told Maryam to say that you have took a vow of abstinence, so that she took a vow of silence, meaning that she said she won't speak to anybody. She took a vow of abstinence that she won't speak to anybody. Alright? And that's sawm, to abstain. Alright? And So that's the meaning of fasting, right? And in our case, the fasting that we do is abstaining from food, drink, and our desires. And let's get into some of the virtues. Why do we do this act of fasting? What did the Prophet Sallallahu he said in hadith, Man saama Ramadan, imanan wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhanbi. That whoever fasts in this month, the month of Ramadan, Imanan with Iman and Ihtisaban hoping for this reward. That his past sins will be forgiven for him. The tremendous reward of Sawm Ramadan, right? And as we know that the, the the commandment for fasting only came one time in the Quran. Came one time. Showing its importance. And that fasting is obligatory upon everybody except for those who are exempted, right? As in, as in the ayah that Talha recited. And so what is the reward for fasting? Does, can anybody tell me the reward for fasting? Other than what we mentioned about the reward from Allah subhanahu uh, that he will forgive your sins, right? Is there anything else? No, fasting is one of those things that Allah subhanahu uh, that the Prophet sallallahu said that Allah said that Kullu amal ibn Adam lahu that every action of the son of Adam is for himself illa sawm except for fasting fa innahu li wa ana ajzi bi that this, for, this is for me and I reward for it and Allah is al azim He is the great. So we can only imagine what His reward will be. How great His reward will be. And inshaAllah Ta'ala, we're just going to uh, mention a, a little story. Right? A story of a companion. His name is Talha. Talha ibn Ubaidillah. Right? And uh, Talha was one of the greatest companions. Right? He was from the ten that we know of the Ashar al-Mubashirin, right? The ten promised paradise. And Talha was known, he had a nickname. His nickname was the living martyr. In the battle of Uhud, he was one of, uh, amongst a couple of the companions that surrounded the Prophet wasallam to make a shield from, from the Prophet being hit. And we know that Talha was hit with a couple of arrows. And he ended up being paralyzed, partially paralyzed in his arm after that. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said, if you guys want to see, be pleased with somebody, and see what a martyr looks like, it is, look at Talha, Talha. So we look at this, we, we hear from Talha, that it's narrated that he saw in a dream, right? He saw in the dream that he, that there were two men, right? And these two men, 
they came to Rasulullah from a place called Bali. And they came together and they accepted Islam together. But one of them was more uh, ijtihad than he. He strove more in the path of Allah than the other. And until he actually died a martyr, he died a shaheed. And as we know, dying a shaheed is from the greatest ways to die. All right? And the other lived for another year and he passed away. So Talha, he says that he has this dream. And in his dream, he is by the doors of Jannah. He's by the gates of Jannah. And he is with these two people. He is with these two people. And then someone comes out from the gates of Jannah and calls the second one. Not the one who died a shaheed. He calls the second one. And he says, he tells him to enter. Then some time passes. And then he calls the shaheed, the one who died in the path of Allah. And then after some time, he, go, he hears the voice again and he tells Talha to go back, that is not your time. So Talha wakes up and this amazed him. Why did it amaze him? Because we know dying a shaheed is, is one of the greatest things that you can do in Al-Islam. And he knows that the next one, he did not die a shaheed. So how did the, the, the other one enter paradise before the shaheed? How did this happen? He was very amazed by this. So he went amongst the companions and they were talking about it until the news reached the Prophet ﷺ, right? And the Prophet ﷺ, he asked him, what's, what's amazing about this? What surprises you about this? And Talha said, um, sorry, and he, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that, um, I'm sorry, that Talha, he said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, that the other one, he was more, he strove more in the path of Allah. And then he died in the path of Allah. And he, the other one, entered Jannah before him. How is this? And then the Prophet wasallam he said, did he not live another year after him? And the, the, the companion said, of course, he did. Did he not, then the Prophet ﷺ said, did he not witness another, another month of Ramadan? And then Talha answered, of course. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, did he not pray such and such in this month, uh, in this year, I'm sorry? And he said, of course he did. He said, the Prophet ﷺ said, the difference between the two of them is like the difference between the earth and the skies. And from this hadith, we can see that somebody who fasted in the month of Ramadan and had the opportunity to pray that he entered Jannah before the shaheed. So we can only imagine how great this reward is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And another last point is that As-Siyamu wal-Qur'an yashra'ani lil-abdu yawm al-Qiyamah is that the Psalm and the Qur'an will intercede for the slave on the Day of Judgment. And it's, uh, what would Siyam say? What the Siyam would speak, and he says, and it would say that verily, that the Psalm, he prevented me from food and my desires in the day. So intercede for me. So it would intercede for him. And then the Quran would say that I prevented him from sleep in the night. So intercede for me. And then they will intercede for him. So in this month, we enter the month of Shahrul Quran, right? The month that Allah revealed the Quran, as again, as our Shaykh Talha recited, Shahrul Ramadan al unzila fihi al Quran. The month of the Qur'an, we have the opportunity to have these two actions come together. The Psalm and the Qur'an. 
And inshallah, we, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make, the, make us of those who recite the Quran and fast the month of Ramadan and that it's accepted from us, inshallah. Ameen, ameen. And Jazakallah uh, khairan, I appreciate your time. And without further ado, um, I'd like to pass the mic over to our Shaykh Al Hafiz um, Adib Zaman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Hamdan yuafi ni'amahu wa yukafiu mazida. Sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina wa Mawlana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Uh, welcome everyone to our Ramadan ready lecture. And uh, the purpose of this lecture, as the title is clear, is to be ready for the month of Ramadan. To be ready for the month of Ramadan. And so we divided this lecture into three main parts. The first, we want to understand what are the virtues of the month of Ramadan and the, month, the virtues of fasting and the virtues of the Quran and our Ustad Khalid has mentioned that. The second uh, aspect of the lecture which I will touch on now inshallah are some of the ahkam related to fasting because we want to make sure that we're coming into the month of Ramadan and we have valid ibadah. We enter and we exit with valid ibadah that our fasting fulfills the conditions that has been placed by Allah and His Messenger. We don't want to be wasting our hunger and thirst and then at the end of it to come away with an invalid fast because we did not know what are the ahkam of fasting. And then after that, so we're going to go into a brief, brief summary of some of the ahkam of fasting. And then after that, we are going to uh, finish off by giving a summary of how the fasting person should spend their day. How the fasting person should spend their day. So we begin ala barakatillah. Uh, we first talk about when does the fast of Ramadan become mandatory? When the, the first, when does the fast of Ramadan become mandatory? We know that the month, the lunar month, has either 29 or 30 days. The lunar month either has 29 or 30 days. No month, Islamic month, can have 28 days. And no Islamic month can have 31 days. So it's either 29 or it is 30 days. If the moon is not sighted on the 29th, then we complete 30 days of the month. In this case, we are in the month of Sha'ban, and the 29th is, when is the 29th of Sha'ban, anyone? Huh? Today? Well, today is the 29th night, right? But tomorrow is the 20, uh, 29th day of Sha'ban. So we look for the moon. If the moon is not sighted, then we complete Sha'ban 30 days. So when does the fast of Ramadan become mandatory? Obligatory in everyone if the month of Sha'ban completes 30 days. If we have 30 days of Sha'ban, automatically, without a doubt, the next day is Ramadan because Sha'ban cannot have 31 days. So once, if Sha'ban goes on to 30 days, then the next day automatically is the day of Ramadan. But before we complete 30 days, we want to make sure that the month is not 29 days and that is done by looking for the moon, looking for the moon. When else does the fast of Ramadan become mandatory? It's obligatory on an individual who sees the moon himself, even if his sighting is not accepted. So if somebody sees the moon and you know what the moon looks like and it's not something easy to sight, right? You have to have some kind of uh, experience or knowledge of what the moon looks like and the phases of the moon and so on. If a person sees the moon and his sighting is not accepted, for example, in an Islamic country, you will go to the judge, right? You will go to the Qadi and you will inform the Qadi, I saw the moon. And depending on who that person is, their, pers their testimony might not be accepted, right? They might be a person who had uh, fisq, they had some prior sins, open sins, which made their testimony rejected. So a person sees the moon, but for whatever reason their testimony is not accepted, they still have to fast. You saw the moon, even if people don't believe you, Nobody believes you, you have to pass. You saw the moon. It's also obligatory on an individual who is informed by somebody he trusts that the moon has been sighted. Somebody tells you, comes and tells you, and you trust this person, and you trust that they have done their research, that the moon has been sighted. 
then you also are obliged to fast based on that person's testimony as long as you believe that that person is giving you accurate information. Even if, once again, the testimony of that person is not accepted for whatever reason. This is what we call wujub uh, khas. The, the first uh, number two and three are wujub khas, which is essentially that a person fasts individually, individually mandated on them. When does it become mandatory on the entire Muslim ummah to fast? If a trustworthy adult male sights the moon, and this is verified by an Islamic authority, by an Islamic authority, a trustworthy Muslim male sights the moon, and then he goes to the Islamic authority, the judge, and the judge verifies that and declares that this is now the next day of Ramadan. Everyone is obligated to fast the next day. Obviously, we are living in America. We don't have an Islamic authority. We don't have a judge. We don't have a party that we can go to. So this does not apply to us, right? This does not apply to us where we are uh, in an Islamic country where there's a declaration from an, the Islamic authority of that country. If the moon is sighted in a region, fasting becomes obligatory on the neighboring region that shares that general horizon. This is a disputed uh, issue amongst the fuqaha. If the moon is sighted somewhere in the world, is it obligatory on everyone in the entire world to fast? Or is it only obligatory on the Muslims of that region? to complete the fast or, or start fasting. This is a classical difference of opinion amongst the scholars, whether everyone has to fast or only the people of that region. When we say the region, meaning they share the same night and the same day. They begin their day the same time, they end their day the same time. And this is what we call local, right, local sighting. You might have heard this term before, local sighting. What it refers to is not Local as in the country. Or the first to local as in you are in a region where everybody begins and ends the, the day at the same time. So for example, if somebody sees the moon in California, this is not local sighting. Right? Even though they're in the same country, this is not local sighting. This is international sighting. Because California, they begin their day later than us. And they end their day later than us. So this is, this is what will be considered international sighting. Uh, local sighting would be anyone who is on from north to south on the east coast basically, right? In the east coast, they begin and end their day at the same time. If they, anybody in the east coast sees the moon, then fasting becomes obligatory on everyone in that region. Right? This is with the position of local sighting. And the other position is if the moon is sighted anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, then uh, fasting becomes mandatory on everyone, everyone in the Muslim Ummah. And as we mentioned, this is a classical ikhtilaf amongst the scholars. And for what concerns us, we're going to follow our community. We're going to follow our community. The community that we are going to, the message that we're going to, says that we're starting this day, then that's what we're going to do. And they say we're starting the next day, then this is what we will follow. But it's just good to know what are the reasons why we have you know, some of these uh, debates and ikhtilaf amongst the scholars on this issue. If a person is uh, traveling, you are traveling uh, in a land, and you meet to that land, you must follow the, the people of that land. You must follow the people of that land if they are fasting or not fasting. And this applies to the beginning of the month and the end of the month. So if you travel and you find the people fasting, you are also obliged to fast. What happens if you uh, travel and you meet in another town and you fast with them and you end your fast with them and you only have 28 days. It so happens that you only ended up fasting 28 days because you traveled to that land and you started and ended with them and uh, you ended up only having 20 days for yourself then you have to make up that day later. Right? You have to make up that day later. So when you travel you, uh, you follow the people of that land. All right. Uh, this, as we said, this is not as concerning for us. We're going to follow our community, right? When the community decides we fast, we fast. And when uh, they, they say that we break our fast, we're going to break our fast. But what is more important, though, is for us to uh, know the ahkam that are more related individually, inshallah. And that's what we're going to move into uh, afterwards. Conditions for obligation of fast. Who has to fast? Who has to fast? 
Number one, you have to be a Muslim. Uh, the condition for obligation of fasting is on a Muslim. A non-Muslim is not obligated to fast in the sense that they are first obligated to fulfill the condition which makes fasting valid, which is Islam. So they're first addressed to become Muslim. When they come, become Muslim, then they are addressed to observe the fast. So if they're not a Muslim, then they are not obligated to fast. However, they are still held responsible for missing fasting and missing any of the obligations of Islam in the next life. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, ما سلقكم في سقر will cause you to enter the fire. And they will say, قالوا لم نكو من المصلين. They will say, we were not from those who prayed. And at the very end of the set of verses, they will say, ولم وكنا نكذب بيوم الدين. Showing that they were disbelievers. But yet Allah asked them about salah. And they will be asked about the obligations, even though they were disbelievers. So they will still be accountable in the next life. But in this life, they're the condition is not there to fast unless you are a Muslim. The next condition is intellect. If a person is not of sound intellect, they are not obligated to fast. If a person is not of sound intellect, then they are not obligated to fast. Maturity. If a person has not reached the age of maturity, they are not obligated to fast, but they can still fast and it will be valid. If a person reaches the age of discernment, a young child, then and they are able to fast, they can fast. This fast will be valid, but it would be a uh, sunnah for them. It would be, uh, uh, they would get the reward of the sunnah, but this would not be uh, an obligation on them. So the child, and when do we start commanding our children to fast? When they reach the age of seven. When they each reach, reach the age of seven, as the scholars have mentioned, uh, in analogy to the salah, just like the salah, when the child reaches the age of seven, they should be commanded to, to pray. Likewise, for any other obligations like the fasting as well, when they reach the age of seven, they should be commanded to fast. And when they reach the age of ten, then they should be disciplined if they are not fasting. But it is not mandatory for them to fast, but if they fast, it will be valid. And uh, the fourth condition for the fast to become obligatory is the person must have the ability. They must have the ability if a person is very ill, they are sick, they are not able to fast, then the fasting is Dropped for that person. Dropped for that person. They don't have to fast. So these are the conditions for the fasting to become obligatory. Then we have conditions for the fast to become valid. Now you are obligated to fast. And you go through your day and you are fasting. What are the conditions that must be fulfilled before this fasting day is valid? Number one, you must have the intention. Number one, you have, must have the intention. When do, you, when do you have to have the intention? From the night before. From the night before. Right? Any part of the night. As long as dawn has not come in, then the night is the place for the intention. You cannot make the intention for an obligatory fast after the day has began. You must make the intention between uh, when the night comes in and when the night is leaving. And you must also specify the type of fast you are making. So if you're fasting for Ramadan, then this is, you make an intention in your heart that this is an obligatory fast for Ramadan. If you are doing a sunnah fast, you would make an attention according to whatever you're intending. If you're making a makeup fast, or you're making a fast because you vowed to make a fast, your intention will depend, be dependent on what type of fasting you are doing. So this needs to be made uh, at night, you need to make the intention at night. You need to know what type of fast you are doing. And this needs to be repeated every single night. Every single night in the nights of Ramadan. Before the, the, the day starts, you make the intention, I am fasting tomorrow. And this is the position of the majority of the scholars. The majority of the scholars, they say that this intention must be every single night. You make the intention every single night. There is a position uh, of Imam Malik. Imam Malik is of the view that you can make the intention at the beginning of Ramadan. Make one intention and that is sufficient for the entire month. And our scholars have advised that you do this as a backup plan. As a backup plan, you make at the beginning of Ramadan attention, I'm going to fast the entire month of Ramadan. So that way, if you forget to make the niyyah one night, 
At least you have made the intention for the entire month. Our scholars have mentioned this as a backup plan because it can be sometimes, you know, you are, uh, get busy at night and you forget to make the intention before. But it is important to uh, get into that habit of making the intention and it's not something that requires any extra effort. It's something you say in your heart. I intend to fast the month, uh, the next day for Ramadan. You must be a Muslim for the fast to be valid. Abstaining from the nullifiers, al imsaku anil mufattirat. Abstaining from the nullifiers of fasting. And we will mention these, inshallah, uh, upcoming. Free from menstruation and postpartum bleeding. Al-naqa'u min al hayd wa nifas. So uh, a woman, uh, this applies specifically to the woman, uh, if she has her menses or she has bleeding after giving birth, then this will nullify the fast. This will nullify the fast. If she already had this before, then she doesn't fast to begin with. But let's say she started fasting. She started fasting and her menses came during the day of Ramadan, then that fast that day is nullified and she must make it up afterwards. So the entire day must be free from menstruation and postpartum bleeding. Of course, we would not you normally expect uh, a woman who has given birth to fast, and usually she would not be uh, fasting, but the woman uh, who is uh, not yet menstruating, she's obviously obligated to fast. If the menstruation comes during the day, then the fast is no longer valid, even if it comes with one minute left, one minute left before Maghrib, and the menses comes, then that day is, the, that the fasting is invalidated for that day, she must make it up afterwards. A person must have al-aqlu jami' al-nahar, be sane the entire day. All right, so if a person somehow, for whatever reason, loses their intellect, they lose their mind, then the fasting will be invalidated and they have to make that day up when they regain their sanity back. And the day, salahiyatul al-waqt or salahiyatul yawm, the validity of the day. If you are fasting, that day that you are fasting must be a valid day for you to fast. And this is really referring to outside Ramadan. Because inside of Ramadan, every day in Ramadan is valid for you to fast. But outside of Ramadan, there are certain days we're not allowed to fast. Such as the day of Eid. Right? The two Eids, it is haram to fast. And it is invalid if you fast on that day. So if the day is not a day that accepts fasting, then the fast is not valid. Of course, this applies outside of Ramadan. In the month of Ramadan, all the days of Ramadan, you are obliged to fast. All right, as we mentioned, the intention for fasting, three conditions for a valid intention. Intending from the night, this is called a tabit, tabiyut al And there's a hadith on this, man lam yubayyit al niyyah, fala siyama lahu. Whoever does not make tabit of the niyyah, meaning they incur that niyyah at night, the intention at night, then they do not have a valid fast. So the intention must be made at night. At ta'een, specifying the type of fast, if you're fasting, a sunnah fast, Monday or Thursday, you intend sunnah. If you are intending the fast of Ramadan, this is a wajib fast. You make that intention that this is a wajib fast. If you are intending a makeup fast or a fast based on a vow that you made, all depends on what type you're fasting. Your intention will uh, correspond to the type of fasting you are intending. And as we mentioned, repeating the intention every day. Every night of Ramadan, before the day kicks in, Make the intention that you are fasting the next day in Ramadan. We move on to Mubtila to Sawm, the things that nullify the fast. And of course, these are very important because if your fast is nullified, then it's invalid. You have to make it up afterwards. So it's very important for all of us to be aware of what are the things that nullify the fast. Number one, anything that enters the body cavity. Uh, and the scholars, they, they say this, دُخُولُ عَيْنٍ فِي الْجَوْفِ مِنْ مَنْفَذٍ مَفْتُوحٍ Anything that enters the body cavity from a opening, an opening in the body. The standard openings, of course, are the mouth, the nose. It also includes the ears, the privates. All these are openings of the body. If anything enters, whether that thing is nutritional or not nutritional, anything enters the body from an opening and it leads to the inside, then this will invalidate the fast, right? So if somebody, obviously this includes eating and drinking, but it includes other things. Somebody takes a rock, pick up a rock and they 
swallow it. The rock is not food, but this falls under the uh, condition of anything entering the body cavity. All right, even if it's not nutritional, even if it's not intending to eat or drink, anything that enters the body cavity invalidates the fast. All right, and this can be from the mouth, it can be from the nose, it can be from the ears, it can be from the privates as well. Intentionally vomiting. If you intentionally vomit, then the fasting is nullified. If a person is overcome by vomit, then this does not nullify the fast. As the Rasulullah says in hadith, مَنْ ذَرَعَهُ الْقَيْءِ فَلَا قَضَى عَلَيْهِ If whoever is overcome by vomiting, then there's no uh, makeup due on that person. وَمَنْ اسْتَقَاءَ فَعَلَيْهِ الْقَضَى But whoever intentionally makes themselves vomit, then they uh, must make up that day. Their fasting will be invalidated on that day. Uh, intercourse. If a person between a man and a wife have intercourse, then this is a nullifier of the fast. And not only is it a nullifier, but this also triggers a penalty, a very severe penalty for anyone who does this in the day in Ramadan. And we will mention this inshallah later on. Uh, ejaculation from physical contact. If a person, and we're not going to be try to be as less explicit as possible, but if a person ejaculates by physical contact, this invalidates the fast. As opposed to non-physical contact, such as a person ejaculated by a dream, by a dream, or by thinking, or by looking. These things will not nullify the fast. It will only be nullified if this happened by physical contact by means of physical contact. Insanity, if a person loses their mind in the day of Ramadan, even for a moment, even for a moment, then the fasting will be invalidated on that day. When they regain their sanity, they will make it up after Ramadan. Drunkenness or loss of consciousness, if caused by one's own doing. If a person intentionally drinks alcohol and it causes them to become drunk, or they intentionally do something they take some kind of drugs that cause them to lose their consciousness, then this will nullify the fast and they must make it up afterwards. Uh, we mentioned this already as well. If a, a woman gets her menses in the day of Ramadan, even if she's already started fasting, comes any part of the day, then this will nullify the fast. She must make it up afterwards. And same thing goes for postpartum bleeding. If a woman who has given birth happened to be fasting afterwards and the bleeding comes back, then the fasting is nullified for that day and she must make it up. And giving birth itself is a nullifier of the fast. And apostasy, leaving Islam. The person began the day as a Muslim and they uttered some words of kufr. They cursed Allah and His Messenger. Or they had some, developed some incorrect belief that takes them out of the fold of Islam, their fasting is invalidated on that day, even if they return back to Islam. Even if they say the shahada again, they have to make that day up. Uh, there are certain things that are disliked when you're fasting. You should not do when you're fasting. They do not nullify the fast, but they are disliked. Tasting food without need. Tasting food without need. This will be something that is disliked. It does not nullify the fast as long as Whatever you're tasting does not enter into the, the stomach. But if obviously, if you taste food and you swallow it, this will nullify the fast. But if you're just tasting the food, you're just tasting the food, and it does not go down to your stomach, then this does not nullify the fast. But you should avoid doing this, because there is a high likelihood that it can go down. So you should avoid this, unless there is a need. A person is cooking, they need to check to make sure that the food has enough salt, the food has enough... Uh, ingredients, needed ingredients, then they can do this uh, if there is a need. But one who has no need, you should avoid doing this because you are putting yourself at risk of uh, invalidating your fast. Uh, for married couples, kissing and foreplay, this is something that should be avoided if there is fear of ejaculation or leading to intercourse. If there is fear of ejaculation or leading to intercourse, then this should be avoided. And this is something disliked. If there is uh, if there, this is without fear If a person does not fear right? If you do not fear this If a person is, is very able to control themselves And they know that if they, uh, if, they, if they kiss their wife or something like that This will not lead to anything else further Then this is 
allow but it is disliked. If they fear that this will lead to something further than that, then this becomes haram. Becomes haram. Uh, cupping. There's something called hijama, which is taking out uh, the, the, the blood that is uh, unhealthy blood from the body. And uh, this is a medical procedure called al hijama. This is something that is disliked in, uh, while fasting. But it does not spoil the fast. And there is a ikhtilaf on this. Exaggerating while taking water in mouth and nose during wudu. When normally, when you make wudu, you should exaggerate. Al mubalagha fil istinshaq. You should exaggerate in taking the water in your mouth and taking the water in your nose. You should exaggerate. This is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. However, when you are fasting, you should avoid exaggerating because then this could lead to that water going down, and then this can lead to your fast being invalidated. So avoid exaggerating when taking water in the nose and the mouth during wudu. All right, things that are prohibited uh, when fasting. As we mentioned before, kissing and foreplay with fear. If a person has fear that this will lead to something else later, then this is haram for them to do. And al-wisal, continuous fasting. This is when a person does not break their fast. They fast, and when the time of maghrib comes in, instead of breaking their fast, they continue to fast and stay away from food and drink until the next day. And this may continue for two days, three days, four days. This is something prohibited by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even though he used to do this himself but when they asked him about this he said inni abitu inda rabbi yut'imuni wa yasqini that I, I, I'm with my Lord and he feeds me and he gives me drink so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was allowed to do this as a special exception but he forbade his companions from doing, the, from doing this so when the time for breaking fast comes in you break your fast and you do not continuously fast even in the night this is prohibited <clears throat> what is the ruling on uh, fasting due to sickness and travel? Sickness. If a person is sick and they know that this sickness is going to cause them harm, if they are to fast, then it is becomes haram for them to fast. If you are sick and you know that by fasting this will cause your condition to get worse, it will cause you great harm, then it is haram for you to fast if you are in this condition. If you are not certain, if I fast, maybe I might, it might be harmful or maybe not, then it is dislike for you to fast. If you are sick and you fear, so it's not certain. You're not certain that you're going to be harmed by fasting, but it is a, uh, it's potentially there. You fear that if you fast, you'll be harmed, then it is dislike for a person to fast. And it is wajib for you to fast if you only have a light sickness, if you only have a slight headache. You have to fast, right? If you have a body ache, uh, you hurt your ankle, you, you, you sprain your ankle. This, these are uh, things that don't affect the fast. If you have a light sickness or you have a light injury and it doesn't affect the fast, then you are still obligated to fast. Uh, as for travel, traveling, if you are a travel, if you're in a state of travel, it is permissible whether you are in difficulty or whether you are not within difficulty to uh, abstain from fasting. As long as you meet the following conditions, you must be traveling at a distance that allows you to shorten the salah. Right? So you cannot go from uh, Rockaway Boulevard and you go down to Liberty Avenue and say you're traveling and you want to break your fast. Right? You have to uh, travel at a distance that allows for you to shorten the salah. And this must be permissible travel. A person is traveling to commit a haram action and they say, I'm in a state of traveling. This is not accepted. You must be traveling for a legitimate and uh, permissible means. So if a person is traveling for other than that, then this will be, uh, they will not be allowed to break their fast because of that. And you must be in a state of travel before Fajr. Before Fajr. If you have not yet began your travel and the day has started, you are obligated to fast. All right? So if a person, they are traveling, your flight is at 10 a.m., you have not started traveling yet. You, you don't have the hukum of traveling until you leave, right? And you are actually started the journey. So if you wake up and the day has began or the day is about to begin and you have not traveled yet, then you are obligated to, tra uh, to fast on that day. Only if you are actually in a state of travel, you already started your travel before the day began, 
then you can, and this person is allowed to uh, skip the fasting for that day. Of course, they have to make it up. Both the sick and the traveling, they have to make it up. As Allah says in the Quran, فَعِدَّةٌ min ayamin أُخَرُ Then days uh, uh, afterwards, other days afterwards. What is better for a person who's traveling? If you are traveling, what is better? Uh, if you are not fearing of harm or difficulty, then fasting is better. Because in that way, you don't have to make it up afterwards. So if you are healthy, you're strong, there's no difficulty in traveling, then you can, you can fast. It's better to fast so that you don't have to make it up afterwards. If you have harm or difficulty, then not fasting is better. If you're going to be uh, tired and exhausted because of travel, then it is better to uh, abstain from fasting and make it up afterwards. Alright, we have scenarios for fasting in the month of Ramadan. Um, we'll go through these very quickly, inshallah. Uh, a person who, who must not fast, they must make it up. Must make up, must make fidya. Must pay fidya, no makeup. Must make up, no fidya. Make up, no fidya. Must make up, must offer kafara. We'll go through these one by one, inshallah. Scenario number one This person must not fast. They are not allowed to fast. They are not allowed to fast. But they must make it up afterwards And this is the woman who is in menstruation And the one woman who has uh, postpartum bleeding They are not allowed to fast The fasting is not valid If they even try to fast But they must make it up afterwards Scenario number two A person, they are allowed to abstain from fasting But they must pay the fidya They must pay a fidya And this is a pregnant or breastfeeding woman If they fear for the child So a woman is breastfeeding Or they are pregnant and if they are to fast, they fear that the child will be harmed, not them. They don't have any fear on themselves. They are, they are okay. But if they fear the child, they fear the child is going to be harmed, then they, uh, they don't fast. They must make it up. They also offer a fidya. They must offer a fidya, which is feeding a poor person. Uh, also, the one who delays make a fast without excuse until the next Ramadan enters. If you have fasting, that you miss in Ramadan, you should make it up before the next Ramadan comes. If you did not make it up before the next Ramadan comes, then you are still obligated to make it up, and you must now, in addition, pay uh, an extra penalty for that. Scenario number three, a person must make the fidya, but they don't have to make it up. This is a very old person, but very old person, they're not able to fast, they're very weak, fragile, fasting will be very difficult, if not, uh, it can lead to, lead to even uh, more health problems for them This person, they don't fast But they have to pay the fidya They have to pay the fidya Fidyatun ta'amu miskin They will pay a fidya which is feeding a poor person for every day that they do not fast And a sick person who has a permanent illness A person has an illness Where this illness is not expected to be cured right? They're not expected to recover from this illness Then they don't fast And they Instead, they feed a poor person for every day that they do not fast. Uh, scenario number four, they must make up no fidya. This is a person whose illness is temporary. So you are expected to recover afterwards. You don't fast that day, you skip that day. But after Ramadan, you must make it up. And the traveler, as we mentioned, the traveler is allowed to abstain from fasting. But he must make it up afterwards. Uh, and no fidya is due, no penalty is due. They just have to make it up afterwards. The pregnant and breastfeeding woman who fears for herself or her fears for herself and her child. So this is a woman. Uh, she fears that she will be harmed if she fasts on that day. Then she will become very weak and it will harm her body. Then, uh, or she fears for both herself and the child. Then she makes it up after Ramadan, but there's no uh, fidya on her. She doesn't have to feed anybody. Uh, after, uh, besides that, he just has to make it up. And the one who delays without uh, making up fast without an excuse until the next Ramadan enters, uh, with an excuse, sorry, with an excuse, you you miss some fasting in Ramadan, and you did not get a chance to make it up because that excuse that you missed the fast with was still ongoing. In that case, you still have to make it up, but there's no fidya, there's no penalty due. And the apostate who returns to Islam, a person left Islam for whatever reason, once they enter back into Islam, they must make up the fast 
but there is no other thing other than that. The insane, drunk, and unconscious person, whoever caused their condition without excuse, whoever caused their condition without excuse, then they, uh, they have to make it up. They have to make it up, uh, but nothing else is due other than making it up. And as we mentioned, the one who did not make the attention at night, uh, and as we said, you make it the backup plan, make the attention at the beginning of the month of Ramadan, so that you don't fall into this category of having no intention. All right, so you try to make the intention every single night, but you make the intention at the beginning of the month, so that at least if you miss uh, the intention, you are covered by making that intention at the beginning. Uh, but for those who believe that the intention must be every single night, and they did not make that intention, then this would uh, be uh, a case in which that fast was not valid, and they would have to make it up. Scenario number five, a person uh, does not have to make up, and they do not have to pay any fidya. And this is a child who reaches uh, puberty. So a person, a child, on the day of Ramadan, they reach puberty on that day. All right, on that day, uh, during the middle of the day, uh, they don't have to make up that day. Right? They don't have to make up that day, nor, nor do they have to uh, pay any fidya. Or the uh, insan insane person who, whose insanity is not by their cause. A person has uh, insanity due to natural means, then fasting is not obligated on them to begin with. And so there's no makeup, there is no fidya. The disbeliever, a disbeliever comes in to accept Islam. He's been living for years. He never fasted all those years before. Do we tell that disbeliever you have to make up the fast? No. When they enter Islam, everything is forgiven from that time period before, and they just are responsible for what comes after. But they don't make up the fasting that they missed in kufr. They don't make up salah or any other of the obligations. All right, and lastly, uh, a person who must make up and must offer the kafara. This is a one who has marital relations in the day of Ramadan. Uh, actual marital relations, not what leads up to it, but actual marital relations during the day, intentionally by choice. Being aware of its prohibition, then this person, they must uh, make it up and they also have to have a kafara, which is fasting 60 consecutive days. Right, this is a very uh, stringent uh, penalty. Whoever does this, they must fast 60 consecutive days. If they are unable to do so, then they must feed 60 poor people. They must feed 60 poor people. Um, I think we are at, the, at that time, so we're going to, inshallah, pause here. Um, brother, say it. So we continue afterwards, or are you? Five minutes? Okay, inshallah. Okay. All right, uh, some of the other ahkam, we'll skip that for now, inshallah, and uh, move on to uh, the fasting person's day. All right, we'll end off this with the fasting person's day. Uh, so the first thing what you do when you are fasting, you wake up and you should offer the suhoor. Offer the suhoor. And this is a sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tasahharu fa inna fi sahuri baraka. Rasulullah sallam says, offer the suhoor, and in the suhoor is baraka. And not just offering the suhoor, but also delaying it. Delaying it to the very uh, end. Uh, however, you should be careful not to delay too far. The suhoor too far, where you come to the point where the uh, fajr is coming in. All right? And there is a hadith that is widely misunderstood. Widely misunderstood. That may cause a lot of people to lose their fasting. Because they take this hadith literally. And there's hadith in which the Prophet says, if the adhan, the mu'adhin calls the adhan, and there is a drink in one of your hands, do not put it down until you finish it. This hadith, according to all the classical scholars of Islam, is not meant to be taken literally, meaning that you can still continue to eat a drink when fajr has come in. Right? So this is very important. If the fajr has come in and it is... Uh, establish that the, the, the Fajr has come in, then you must stop eating or drinking. And this hadith, the scholars have explained that this is referring to the Adhan of Bilal. The Adhan of Bilal, because during that time they used to have two Adhans. Bilal would call the Adhan before the time. And Ibn Umm Maktoum would call the Adhan when the time comes in. In the Bilal, you 
فَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يُؤَذِّنُوا إِبْنِ أُمِّي مَكْتُومٍ Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that Bilal he calls the adhan at night. So when you hear Bilal's adhan, continue to eat a drink. But when Ibn Ummi Maktoum calls the adhan, then this was when the actual Fajr comes in. And once Fajr comes in, then you cannot eat or drink. And so that hadith, be careful with that hadith. We have the Salah times, we know exactly when Fajr comes in. When the time comes in, then you must make sure you stop eating or drinking. And this is why it's also recommended to stop a little bit before, five, ten minutes before the time for Fajr comes in to be on that safe side. And it's also reported in the hadith that Rasulullah he was asked, they were asked, the companions, they were asked how long before the salah and when Rasulullah would finish uh, eating the suhoor in the morning. And they said, he, uh, they said that it was the length of about 50 verses of the Quran. The length it took to recite 50 verses right, of the Quran. So be careful of going too close to the adhan. Once the adhan comes in, the time for fajr comes in, you must stop eating or drinking, and if you continue to eat or drink after that, then the fast is invalidated on that day. All right, uh, so you eat the suhoor in the morning, and then you pray fajr. All right, uh, no benefit if a person is fasting and they are not praying. All right, um, this defeats the entire purpose of fasting for a person to fast and they don't pray their salah. So you pray fajr preferably in the jama'ah, uh, especially, especially emphasized for the males to come to the masjid. And it becomes so much easier in Ramadan to come to the masjid in Ramadan because you're already up, right? You are already up. For most of us, the problem coming to the masjid is that it's hard to get up in the morning. But you're already up in the morning because you're eating your suhoor. So you're already up, you can come to the masjid and pray the jama'ah. Uh, during the day, you're busy, busy yourself with worship and beneficial things. Avoid, obviously, sins disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Avoid anything that has no value or benefit as well. Reciting Quran, month of the Quran, Shah Ramadan al unzil fi al Quran. The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed. So, this is the month in which it is even more emphasized to recite the Quran. Uh, making dua. This is one of the categories of people who the dua is not rejected. The fasting person, hatta yuftir, until he breaks his fast. Until he breaks his fast. Uh, giving, being charitable in the month of Ramadan. The Rasulullah was the most charitable of people. Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ajwadun nas. The most charitable of people. Wa ajwadu ma yakun fi Ramadan. It was even more charitable, charitable and even more giving in the month of Ramadan. And we have many opportunities to give in the month of Ramadan. The, uh, the, the, the best way that you can give is feeding a fasting person. Man fatara sa'iman kana lahu mithlu ajrihi. Whoever feeds a fasting person, they will get the reward of that fasting person. You get the reward as if you fasted that day as well. Guarding one's tongue, avoiding backbiting, slandering any of the diseases of the tongue. Whoever does not leave off a false speech and acting upon it, then Allah is not in need of him leaving his food and his drink. Hastening to break the fast. So it's recommended to delay the suhoor and then when the time comes in, hastening to break the fast. Meaning, as soon as the sun has set, it is recommended to break your fast and not delay. Once the sun has set, whether the, uh, the mu'adhin calls the adhan on time or not, once the, the time comes in, you break your fast. This is the sunnah of Rasulullah to hasten to break the fast as long as it is on time. We have to make sure that the time has actually come in. All right, if you are doubtful, I'm not sure if Maghrib has come in or not, don't break your fast until you're certain that the time has come in, then hasten to break the fast. Uh, it was mentioned feeding a fasting person, this carries great reward, as if you are fasting yourself. And uh, the special uh, Salat at Taraweeh in the month of Ramadan, we uh, know that this is also something very virtuous. Man qama Ramadan, imanan wa ihtisaban. Whoever uh, stands in the nights of Ramadan with iman and expectation of Allah's reward, then this person will be forgiven of all his sins. Uh, and then as we conclude our day, we make our attention to uh, fast the next day and we repeat this uh, process the next day until we complete the month of Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to 
uh, accept from us all of our ibadat, our fasting, our recitation of Quran, our salah, and all of our actions in the month of Ramadan. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to reach the month of Ramadan. It's only a day or two away, but we still make that dua for Allah to uh, allow us to reach the month of Ramadan. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم جزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, I apologize for the little delay we'll, we'll go straight into Salat al-Isha in about two minutes we we'll open the floor for just a few questions we have a question here what should a person do if they're traveling in Ramadan they begin the fast in the morning but leave their home by plane in the middle of the day. When should they break the fast if they do not reach their destination before Salat al Uh So, uh, uh, as we mentioned before, the condition for you to abstain from fasting if you're traveling, if you are in a state of travel before Fajr, before Fajr. You need to be in a state of travel before Fajr. If you wake up uh, in the day of Ramadan, and you have, you're not yet traveling, then fasting is still mandatory on you. You still have to fast. And you're not yet in a state of travel. Now when you start, uh, yeah. so you continue to fast. You, you still have to fast that day. It's mandatory for you to fast. If you, are, if you have started the travel after the day has begun. Now if you are f uh, traveling and you overcome some, you, you, uh, you meet some difficulty, great difficulty, then you can, uh, you can break the fast due to the difficulty, not due to the travel, due to the difficulty, right? But you must be in a state of travel before the fasting day begins for you to be in the, that uh, hukum of uh, breaking the fast. Mm. Oh, right, okay, so you're traveling and uh, you're st as long as you're traveling, you are fasting until the sun sets, wherever, wherever you are. You eventually reach a destination, right? If you're flying for 12 hours, Allahu Alam. Allahu Alam. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Once you know that the, the, the time has come in, the Maghrib time comes in, you break your fast. With some water, with some dates, as long as you know the time is coming, you break your fast, and then you come home and you have your your your, your meal later on. Okay, Spe specifically. Uh, okay. Okay. So, uh, injections. You're talking about injections and these kind of things, right? Okay, a person visiting the doctor. Injections, there is, uh, there, this is a modern issue. Right? This is a modern issue and the scholars have uh, differed in terms of the injections. There are three main opinions when it comes to injections. Right? The first uh, opinion is that any type of injection breaks your fast. Right? This is the first opinion. Any injection breaks the fast. The second opinion is that injections don't break the fast. Right? They do not break the fast. The third opinion is that the injection if it is nourishing and nutritional, then it's taking the ruling of eating and drinking and it breaks the fast. All right, so that's a third opinion. To be in the safe side, you should avoid all right, injections. You should avoid injections. Um, other than that, examinations, those examinations, unless something is entering the body, all right, something is entering the body, as we mentioned, from uh, an opening of the body, then this would not break the fast unless something is entering. So, right, there's something being inserted into the body, then this will break the fast. So a person who has these type of visits, if they can avoid it, avoid it in the month of Ramadan. If they have to, then this is, uh, might be a case of necessity. Allahu Alam. All right, can we get blood drawn uh, while fasting? Once again, this, right, this comes under the ruling of injections. Uh, to be on the safe side, you should avoid it. And these things can also make you weak as well. It can make you weak. Uh, and cause you to uh, have to break your fast due to weakness. So uh, you should avoid uh, drawing blood during the month of Ramadan.
So that is a huge discussion. We we're trying to avoid that because that's an hour long discussion. As we mentioned, there is local siding, right, which is people who share the same night and day. They begin and end their day the same. Nobody applies this today, by the way. Local siding, nobody really applies this because this would be only East Coast, North America, right? So if you follow California siding, that's not local siding, that's international, right? Uh, so there's local and then there's international. Anywhere the moon is seen, we fast. Now what happens today is uh, each country they declare their own timings for when Ramadan begins and when Ramadan ends. This falls under a third category, which is called Hukm al-Hakim. Hukm al-Hakim yurfa' al-Khilaf. That once the Hakim, the legitimate authority of the, of the Muslim uh, leader of that country, declares that this is the first day of Ramadan, there's no khilaf anymore. The, 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 that ruler must be, uh, his, his, his word goes, and that country begins fasting. So that is what's happening in most of the countries. So, but that's only valid for the people of that country who are under that rule, ruler, or under that authority. So applying that to where we are, we are only going to do either local or international siding. As we said, nobody really does local, as in, Beginning and ending this day at the same time, that would be East Coast uh, America. All right, so it's either going to be uh, the local community looking for the moon, right, or international sighting. But what happens in the countries, that's, that's, that's a third category of where the ruler declares that this is the first day of Ramadan and they follow that. that. So that will be binding on the people who are in those countries, not binding on anybody else. Allah people follow, people follow it, right? People follow it. But it's not. Uh, well, that, that's a different issue. That's a different issue whether we can accept uh, the astronom astronomical calculations to begin the month of Ramadan. Can we accept it uh, to affirm a sighting? Can we accept it to negate a sighting? That's another, that's another issue um, which will require um, a longer discussion. Uh, not, and we don't have the time to get into that right now. Allahu Alam. Zakhmala Khairu, we'll close now. Subhanakallah, we'll be Hamlik, and Shadwala Ilahi Land, when I start for Kuna to be like. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, and Asr in the Linsan Lafi Husser, Illa Ladina Amanu Amilo Salihat, to us over Haki, to us over Summer.